will be recording. Ah, there it goes. We will be recording um, this webinar so that we can post it um, for people. We had a couple of schools with open houses tonight, and I heard from a couple of parents that there's like middle school football games and great things like that going on. So we have other people who will be able to watch this later. And I really thank Dr. McGowan for uh, allowing us to record and share all of her knowledge tonight. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Dr. McGowan. Um, I will tell you, I'm going to read a little bit about her in just a minute. Um, but a couple of years ago, she came to the GTEAC meeting. And I was not present at that meeting. I think I had something uh, with my kids that night, but a parent called me afterwards and talked to me for an hour about all of the knowledge that Dr. McGowan shared, and it really made me have a better understanding of my own child. And uh, when I was in Northeast, I asked her to come and visit with parents there, and people loved her. She's very bright, um, lots of great information about GT Kids, so I think you will enjoy her. So I have a little bit about her background to share with you. Dr. McGowan worked as a psychiatric nurse for nine years before deciding to pursue an advanced degree in clinical psychology. She attended Baylor University where she obtained her doctorate in clinical psychology in 1992. Dr. McGowan has worked, at the, worked as the behavior therapy director at the Child and Adolescent Psychiatric Service at the Austin State Hospital from 1992 to 1997, providing individual, group, and family therapy. She met Dr. James Webb when she attended a gifted conference in Austin, searching for answers for her own children. He was very persuasive in his efforts to enlist her to work in the field of giftedness. Dr. McGowan opened San Antonio Gifted and Talented in 2015. She provides assessment, individual therapy for gifted of all ages, family therapy, and parent education. So I hope you enjoy her tonight. Um, I think you really will. She's fabulous. So Dr. McGowan, they are all yours. So I appreciate your kind words. <clears throat> I want to start where we're all at on the same page, and that's that the, the group of kids, the group of students that we're talking about, many of them are highly sensitive. Many of them are extremely intense. Um, they're highly imaginative. They're keenly observant. And they're readily able to make connections that a lot of children um, of the same age are unable to do. Um, they have a precocious understanding of, of the world. And that combined with their emotional intensity really puts them at risk um, in situations like COVID uh, for anxiety and, and depression. Now, for the gifted, studies have shown that they're, they're no more anxious than you know, everyone else, all the other kids in the population. And for severe depression, there's about the same levels of that as well. But what, what they are more susceptible to is existential depression. And you know that comes from how they think, how they interpret information, and the conclusions that they draw from information. And you get a lot of um, what's the meaning of life? Uh, what's the point? What am I supposed to do with this life? Those types of questions. And so it, it makes them uniquely vulnerable when you come into a situation like COVID. And I think it's not just the fact that, that COVID and everything um, that has happened since that started, but also the length of time that has passed where they've been required to adapt their lives um, to adjust to this. So I wanted to talk about some of the strategies for helping them cope and some of this comes from the National Association of Gifted Children. Some comes from the college, uh, the Colorado Department of Education on their website. And some comes from Keo Morse, who is at Stepping Stone School for the Gifted. Um, the first strategy is controlling the flow of information. You have some control over what gets in, 
to these kids' heads. But once it's in there, once the images are in there, it's really tough ever getting it out there. Their memories are, are so um, keen and their emotions are very memorable for them. They, they can re-experience emotions that happened, say, three or four years ago. And when they think about the situation that um, brought those emotions about, they feel it just as sharply as they did when that happened. And you know, I, it's something unique that I see in gifted children. So in controlling the flow of information, you wanna watch for having the TV on in the background, the radio on the background, and the internet on in the background. They can uh, pick up very rapidly on uh, certain words and kind of seem to pinpoint on those things. And even if you don't notice that they maybe are listening in the background, believe me, I, I hear it from them all the time that that's how they have attained information. And also, you know, overhearing things from other kids, which you really can't control. Um, so use headphones when, when the news is on, um, we've got the radio on and just be aware when they're in the area and you're, you're listening to um, the news. And again, you know, sometimes that pops up for 15 seconds in between a program and you don't really know it's coming and all of a sudden it's out and, and they've heard it. And also be aware when other adults are discussing distressing news um, in front of your children and tactfully intervene, um, either by removing your child from the situation, kind of subtly suggesting that they, you know, why don't you go do this or take a look at that, um, or quietly asking Uncle Ralph to discuss the topic maybe at a later time or um, somewhere where the kids aren't overhearing. Um, a lot is being overheard, and particularly with kids that, and, and we're over some of that, hopefully forever, with, with kids uh, being at home full time, um, being online for schooling. When they're in the home all the time, adults get very little privacy in those circumstances. And they're upset, they're stressed out, and the adults need to talk about it too. And it's difficult to find time away from your kids to do that privately. But just be aware um, that you may need to make an extra effort to do that when your kids are home full time. The second one is if children ask questions, try to respond very matter of factly. Clarify why they're asking to make sure you don't give them too much information. When my oldest son was six and his brother was about four, I picked them up from school and we were on our way home and and my son, oldest one in the back seat, said, so mom, what does sex mean? And, you know, the things that flood into your mind is, oh no, here it comes, it's, fi it's finally here. They finally asked the question and I'm thinking about what I'm gonna say and I'm trying not to rear end the car in front of me. And so uh, I said, well, you know, um, when we watch Animal Planet and I can hear him in the background and his brother's reading a book like this, and he says, yeah, yeah. And I said, well, you know, when they talk about the animals mating and having children and he screamed, stop. And so I wasn't gonna say anything more, but, and then I drew a breath to say, okay. And he saw me draw a breath and he thought I was gonna go on and explain even more. And so it took him a little while to calm down and let me take a breath so that I could say, okay, I'm not gonna say anything else. And that was, the end of it. So many times they're not asking for the level of or extent of information that you could provide to them. So make sure you give it to them in small amounts and kind of see how they react. And then um, don't give them more than they're asking for. Um, don't minimize their concerns. They're, these kids, they're thinking, 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 and they have trouble um, making their brains turn the rest of their body loose. Um, they think at bedtime, um, they think when they're in school, and it's really tough for them to kind of turn that off sometimes. So be calm and reassuring um, and 
correct any false information that they have about what's going on. Um, and, and try to be as truthful as you can without like alarming them. Um, what they're imagining is probably far worse than what the facts are. So the more that you can kind of clear up misconceptions for them, the less anxious they are likely to be. Consider drawing analogies um, with previous national hardships. And, you know, one of those could be, especially in Texas, is, well, remember when we had Hurricane Harvey and all of the people that affected um, on the Gulf Coast, and some of those people lost their homes, and, you know, and that was, like, for a long time, and it wasn't, like, maybe a year and a half, but some of those people probably are still um, having fallout from that. And, you know, school, people couldn't go to school for the time being. And even students like at universities on the other side of the state, they weren't able to go because they were still in Houston and either couldn't get out or were helping their families. So, you know, talk about those types of things and, you know, how those situations were resolved and how, you know, people were strong and they lived through that and, you know, they got by and families kind of uh, stick together and they strengthen one another and they work together to get through times like this. Um, Pearl Harbor is another one. When the United States was attacked, you can kind of talk about that and that's a little more distant for them. So it's not quite as emotionally um, right there. And you can talk about the positive things that actually came out of, of Pearl Harbor. And th there were many. There were many inventions. There were many ideas. Uh, there were many changes that the United States went through. And people, the people of the United States, they rallied. And they really pulled together and got behind their country. So those are all positive things that you can talk about. And you can draw parallels to what you see um, are positive things that have come out of, of COVID. Um, the different medical sciences that in, um, have flourished since that time. Um, a rethinking of the way that we look at pandemics. Um, a lot of different parallels you could, you could draw. Um, reassure them that there is a very low chance of a child dying of COVID. Some of them have concerns about that. More of them have concerns about losing their parents. And when I see kids who are, who are um, scared about that, I talk in a very matter of fact way that people can die. And that's, that's a terrible tragedy for everyone involved. Um, and let's say both of your parents died and there'd be an astronomical chance of that happening. Who would take care of you? What arrangements have been made um, to help you at that time? Um, I had one little boy who told me that if his parents died, that he guess he'd have to live on the street. And he saw no other options of anyone caring for him um, while he was a child. And his parents had no idea that he was thinking about that. These kids, they, they're anxious about a lot of things. And I'm not saying all of them, but because of their wild imaginations that they have, they can, they can you know, think up amazing things. Um, again, my same oldest child, when he was six years old, he started giving us a hard time about taking showers in the evening. And, you know, he was okay with that before. And, you know, what's kind of going on now? And he really wouldn't say, and, you know, it got to be a big deal every night. And so finally he said, when I'm in the shower, I, because the, the shower and the water is so loud, I can't hear anything outside of the shower. And he said, I start to think that maybe the world has ended and everyone is gone and I'm the only one left. And what parent would imagine that? What parent would imagine their kid is thinking like that? So there's oftentimes something going on that you don't know about. And 
you know, with that one, I said, okay, we'll leave the bathroom door open. And whenever you feel like maybe something has happened, you call out to me and just say, mom, are you still there? And he did that for a couple of years. He'd get in the shower and he'd yell, mom, are you still there? And I'd say, yes, I'm dusting in the bedroom or something. And he was okay with that. And then he, he just moved on. So um, be aware that there's all this stuff going on in their heads. Um, reassure them by pointing out the measures that your family is taking to keep all of you safe. And even though they may see that and they may overhear that, sometimes it's helpful to be real concrete about the ways in which you are being careful. And, you know, we're in times where people are really polarized on a lot of different facets of COVID. So acknowledge to them because they're going to come home and they're going to say, you know, Johnny's parents said this and Johnny said that. And, and, you know, it's maybe very different from what you believe. And so just acknowledge to them that people have all sorts of ideas and we believe things that other people do not. And we kind of proceed on what we think is the best. And sometimes it's helpful to say, well, Johnny's parents are doing what they think is best for Johnny and kind of leaving it, you know, so that people have options. Everybody has a difference of opinion. Um, the third one is be mindful of time and space. COVID is worse in some places than in others. And sometimes when kids overhear that something's going on in India, they may not hear that it's in India. They may think that it's going on here as well. So point out to them, you know, if they start bringing information to you that's pretty scary, that, you know, that's on the other side of the world. They have, you know, a different structure over there. They have different access to, to healthcare than we do. They have different medications. They have different doctors. And and help them to get some distance that that isn't necessarily going on in our community right now. And, you know, point out to them, some places have recovered very quickly. Um, there, are, there are some that have not, but some that have. Um, and you can always reassure them with, right now our family doesn't have that. So right now, you know, we're all okay. And sometimes that's enough for them. Um, point out if their fears are related to events that happened a year ago. A year ago, a year and a half ago, we were in a much different place as a country than, and then as a world as we are right now. And there've been, you know, increased understanding of COVID and increased options for treatment. So point out to them if, if they're still worrying and they may well be about things that they heard a year ago Point out to them that you know that that was a year ago, and and um, things are different now. Things are different now. We're more we're more prepared, and we know more about what to do to help with that. Okay, so number four. Within your home and within your family, establish your new normal. And I'm a little bit behind the times with this because you know this this probably points more towards when your kids were primarily home and attending school online. But there are still um, portions of our lives right now that are still strongly impacted by COVID. So some of it can still be useful, I think. Establish your new normal. Um, and a lot of these kids, they push back on change. And part of it is because they need to think about it. And they think and they think and they think. And once they see kind of the rationale and it's gone through their mind, they're pretty quick to adapt. And you know, there's they're they're they have as a group, I think, pretty strong adaptive behavior. So try not to force changes before they are ready to accept them. And I know some sometimes, I mean, there's no choice. If you gotta wear a mask into a certain place and you have to go in there, it's a mask, you know, that's it. And again, you know, a lot of them have adapted by now. And, you know, with kids, a lot of them have told me this is just the way it is. I already know. So a lot of them aren't having as much trouble as we as adults are in making, making some of these changes. Um, 
Okay. Establish new schedules in your home. And again, you know, this was more towards when everybody was home um, and maintain them. So um, if, if anything of COVID is continuing to affect schedule wise in your family, um, go ahead and kind of get into a new predictable schedule. Um, they like prediction. They, not, they like to be able to anticipate what's coming down the pipe for them. And it makes them much less anxious when they know in advance what's going on and what to expect. Be available to listen when they talk about what they miss. If they talk about, um, they miss what it was like before COVID. And some of them, I'm telling you already, they can't even remember. Uh, so a lot of them like to talk and, and, and process what is going on for them. And I think that that is, that is really important. And I'm gonna talk about that in, in a little bit yet again. If your children are still learning at home, establish a designated workspace um, and maintain adequate physical exercise. Plan family exercising, like going for walks, going for bike rides, you know, going swimming somewhere, playing ball in the backyard, anything to get them out of the house um, and, and allow them to blow off some stress just through physical exercise. And you know, if you're in your home and they're they're not having as much contact with people, and you've probably already done this, you know, virtual contact with family members are not, you know, being able to see and friends if they aren't being able to see them. There's still some people I think that are being careful about visiting elderly relatives, and you know, make sure that they have the opportunity to see them online if, if at all possible. If they are needing to virtual uh, socialize. Gifted kids, the ones that are already having socialization difficulties anyway, this may make it even more difficult. Be ready to offer ideas to them, like if they're gonna get on Facebook, or not FaceTime and do something virtually, uh, give them ideas about what they could talk about, things that maybe happened to them during the week that they wanna tell someone about. And also give them ideas um, how they terminate that call when they're finished. A lot of them get nervous about that. I don't know what to say because I don't know, what, you know, nobody's saying anything and then what do I do? So, you know, practice what you would say with them um, as to how, how to uh, terminate a, a phone call or a conversation. Number five, be patient with yourself and others. Um, everyone is stressed out. And if you think that's not true, you get out there on the freeway and you drive for 15 minutes and you'll see everybody's stressed out. Uh, within your home, main, in your lives, maintain as much normalcy as possible. Avoid talking about your own anxieties where your kids can overhear you. And again, you know, we're, we're in such close proximity and everybody is home. That is a tough one, but Try to come up with times that you and your friends or you and your husband can talk about these things where the kids cannot overhear. Your children are always watching you and they will take their cues from your behavior. If you are upset, they will be upset. If you're anxious, they will be anxious. If you're matter of fact about things, then they will tend to be more matter of fact and more calm about what is going on around them. Many families of gifted students are gifted. And you get all these gifted people in a household and they're intense and they're emotionally sensitive and there's a lot going on in those families. So work to kind of keep the stress level down, you know, keep a calm demeanor and do everything you can you know, to, to present as confident in um, how we're taking care of COVID and, and what we're doing to um, avoid getting ill with it. Take care of yourself so that you have the personal resources to take care of your kids. If you are totally stressed out, if you're afraid, it's going to be difficult to take care of your child. So take care of yourself. Plan alone time for yourself. Take care of your marriages. 
plan time for you and your spouse. So it's just the two of you having some time together. Um, that's on that one. So what else can you do? Gifty kids as a group really feel that they need to be listened to. And sometimes all they want is to be heard. Um, I know a six-year-old little boy who would get very frustrated during school. And instead of acting out, you know, we worked with him to let his teacher know what's going on. So after a couple of weeks of practicing this at school, he came in and he plopped down on my sofa and he said, it's not working. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, she's not listening to me. And I said, how can you tell? And he said, she doesn't look me in the eye when she talks to me. He said, she's looking around the room and she's looking at what else is going on. So I can tell she's not listening to me. So they know. Um, give them some time. Even when you're on top of each other, everybody's home a lot. Try to give them some time. Try to give each one of your children individual attention, some one-to-one -one time, even if it's only for 15 or 20 minutes a week. Try to schedule something with each of them that just the two of you do. Um, help your child find and create a private kind of nook at home where when things are getting overwhelming for them, they can go there, There's, they have access to books, they can sit down, they can read, they can just kind of have some quiet time by themselves. And again, you know, that was a big one when kids were all home and everybody was online doing school and parents are home working and everybody's on top of each other. So if they can have a place that they can know that they can go to, that is often helpful. Help your child find ways to make a difference. And for a lot of gifted kids, that's, that's a big deal. They wanna help, they wanna help change things. So they could write thank you letters to first responders, thank you letters to the doctors and nurses in local hospitals. They can read aloud via video chat to younger relatives. And I'm sure their parents would appreciate that too. Um, they can make cards for shut-ins or nursing home residents. It was a long time where nursing home residents you know, and again, I'm not sure about Texas, but I know in other states, they were confined to their room for, for months, literally. And, you know, if your child can write a letter to any one of those, that, that would be a wonderful thing. And it, it would hopefully help your child feel like they were helping as well. Provide them with plenty of books. Um, that was a day of celebration for my husband and I when my children learned to read because they went on automatic pilot. At any time, they could pull out a book and be completely entertained and we would have some time to ourselves. So reading right there. Resources, uh, a lot of these websites have, have um, come up with COVID and your gifted child and suggestions that they have. The Davidson Institute, the National Association for Gifted Children, SENG, S-E-N-G. The Texas Education um, Association has some information about uh, schooling during COVID. The Texas Association for Gifted Children also has some information on their website. And Duke Tips, I'm not sure if Duke does, but I would take a look at their, at their website too. Um, there's, there's a lot of options for kids if you feel like they're not getting enough you know, in school right now. There's online tutoring, and I've heard some wonderful stories from parents who've um, uh, received services from online tutors for their kids. And the direction that they have tended to go is not something to supplement what's going on in school, but something to really stimulate their minds and do something really interesting with science and math. Um, there's also instrumental. You can learn to play an instrument with, with an online instructor. You can learn a different language with online instructors. There's a, a very wide variety of, of uh, options that are available for that. As an aside note, the Davidson Institute is seeking particip 
participants for research on gifted education practices during COVID. And it's for grades three through six that were in remote learning either in 2019 through 2020 or the 2020-2021 school year. If anyone is interested in that, they can go to the Davidson website and find out more information about that. What I am seeing in my practice since COVID has started, um, the usual stuff, I still see the usual stuff. You know, parents want their child tested for giftedness. They wanna find out how gifted their child is. Um, they're doing achievement testing to see if, if the child is, is being challenged at, at their grade level. And so I'm, I'm seeing, you know, still a fair amount of that. I'm seeing with all ages, pure frustration from how they see everything has been handled. From online schooling, to um, vaccinations, to shutdowns, to the, the whole gamut. It has been an extremely frustrating experience for many of the gifted because they, they think very logically. And for many of them, they find it personally offensive when they perceive that people who are in control of them are not thinking in a logical manner and not acting in a logical manner. So that has been a big issue for a number of people that I have seen. Depression, uh, I've seen a number of those cases. And interestingly, that has been more the teenagers that I have seen. Um, and part of that may be because they seem to have had, I mean, besides, you know, online schooling, they're missing a lot and they know they're missing a lot, you know, with, with proms and with graduations and, and football games and, and marching band and, and all of it. And that, that has been very, very difficult for them. Um, <clears throat> And they want to know why it's okay to play football, but it's not okay to be in marching band. I mean, we're both outside, we're all breathing heavily, but they want to know why. Um, they're cut off from their friends. And a big one has also been, this has really interfered with some gifted students' academic goals. I mean, they're intense. And they've got their plan down and you know, it goes off into college and, and you know, off into space and beyond. And they had their plan and this is disrupting um, their plans and they don't like it. Um, it's also affected some of their GPAs and they really don't like that. Now, I have a few students who celebrated when they didn't have to go to school and they could uh, work from home because finally, for the first time in their lives, they, they felt like they were in control of their education and their teacher could no longer tell them, stop, this is where the lesson ends today. And they reveled in it. They just loved it and they really thrived in it. So you get some of both sides. On the other hand, you know, there's been some who have really enjoyed being at home with mom and have had trouble going back to school. So that has also been an, an issue being out so long and then kind of trying to readjust to school and the routine there again. Um, there's been heavy use of electronics when the kids were home. Um, to fill their time. And it's particularly um, been an issue for parents when both parents are working at home. And I have seen some situations where children are holding their working at home parents hostage. And um, the threat, the implied threat is that if you don't let me watch video games all day, then I am going to stand in the background while you're trying to work or you're trying to be in a meeting with your boss and pitch a fit and start throwing things around. So it's been a difficult situation for, for some parents and um, that needs to stop. So even if you have to 
call your employer and bring them in on what's going on, you know, to a minor amount and let them know the next time you're on and something like this comes up that you're going to have to stop and deal with it because this is no way to work. This is no way to live with your children running your lives. So um, if you want to know more information on that, you give me a call. Okay. Roxanne, that's probably what I have for today. I don't know if you had in mind taking questions or if there's time for that. Thank you. I thank you. I appreciate you um, talking to our our parents about kind of where our kids are after a year and a half of dealing with COVID. I think it kind of helps when everybody hears that kids are in the same boat. Like it's not just my house or my child that this is going on with. So I appreciate that. It looks like in the chat, we had a question. Um, somebody asked if you have a book recommendation for helping a GT preteen with self-esteem. I can't think of one right now, but. No, not, not one that's like that specific. Okay. Um, I would recommend going to Hoagie's gifted page and looking at the table of contents. I mean, they have hundreds of articles there and there's very little that they don't address. So I would run through some of those articles and see if it looks like there's one that, that might be effective for your child. And I would pre-read it first and then decide whether you wanted to pass some of that information on to them. And parents, if you didn't hear that, that's Hoagie's Gifted, like Hoagie, like a sandwich that you you eat. I put so the link in is, the chat. Oh, you did? Okay, yeah. thanks. Oh, great. Ah, great. Good job, Meredith. So, Oh, I somebody, will... Jennifer Boyer suggested, there is a Gifted Kids Survival Guide. Thank you, Jennifer, I see that. Okay. Um, I've forgotten about that book. That might be one. Um, I used to use that, I think it was when I had middle school. So um, parents, if there's some middle school parents or older elementary, and I would, no matter what book you get, I would do the same thing that Dr. McGowan just said, make sure you look at that book and read through it first um, to make sure it's everything you, you're okay with everything that's in it for your kiddo. Um, here we have another one. How can you encourage a child who has a hard time opening up about his emotions to actually discuss what or if anything is bothering them? You know, a lot of a lot of gifted children, they really value taking care of things themselves. And some of them have a real hard time sharing information with others. And that can be a real power struggle. And you can't make them do it. I mean, and you know that all, already as a parent. So sometimes just letting them know that you're available. If you decide to talk about this, you let me know and I'll be glad to talk about it. Or if you think you'd like, you'd rather talk to dad about it, just let him know and, and he'll talk to you about it. Um, try, to, try to avoid the power struggle with it. And they'll watch you to see if, if you, Keep your end of the bargain that you know you're not going to keep asking them about stuff and and you know kind of take a step back from that but a number of parents have found that to be fairly effective great and meredith um i'm sorry i'm watching the chat also meredith just dropped the link in the chat for the gifted kids survival guide and somebody reminded me on here also there's a teen one also so it's the Gifted Kids Survival Guide. I put links to both the kids, which is ages 10 and under, and then the teens um, also came up on Amazon. So those are both in the chat. Um, there was an earlier question that said, any recommendations on how to get the school to let your child work at their level? And I'm assuming not just at grade level. So if you're talking about acceleration, um, you 
what I would do again, I would go to Hoagie's gifted page and look through some of the articles there because I know that there are some about acceleration and, and how to obtain acceleration for your child. And it's going to be, it's going to have to be very specific to your child. And really the teacher is going to have to be able to implement it. I mean, it can't be real complicated. And the more ideas and the more guidance you can give the teacher as to kind of what you are looking for and what you would think would be effective, the more helpful that is for them. And for example, I had one student who, I mean, he was, he was a spelling ace, yet all, you know, they'd get the spelling words on Monday and then they'd have to do all these different, you know, activities in the spelling and then on Friday was a quiz. And so his teacher agreed that he'd get the, he'd get the words on Monday and he would take the quiz on Tuesday. And if he scored at 90% or above, he could use the spelling time in a different um, previously agreed upon activity, whether it was, you know, exploring a topic of his interest kind of related to what's going on in school in more depth and like writing report on that and then presenting it to his class sometime, different things like that. The more suggestions you can give, um, the more helpful it is for the teacher and, and the less kind of machinations your teacher needs to go through to kind of get this implemented. Great, thank you. Parents, I know you're asking a lot of questions and we can't get to all of them tonight. Um, but I do wanna share one more question um, with Dr. McGowan. And I think this is one, this is one we've experienced in my own family. And I'm betting this is um, a parent asking that there's probably more of you out there. And that's how do you help your child to shut their thoughts down so they can fall asleep? First, I would sit down with them and ask them for ideas. Usually they have some, some pretty good ideas as to what will be helpful. Reading is typically you know, a pretty good one. And I know a lot of gifted kids, they read until they, they fall asleep. Um, they, some, some use like the kind of meditation uh, tapes where you know, there's different kinds of soothing music you could, um, teach them muscle re progressive muscle relaxation. And you could do a search on that online for how to do progressive muscle relaxation. And it's very easy and it's something they can like lay in bed and do themselves to kind of help them start relaxing. Um, you know, teenagers, a lot of teenagers tell me the only way I can do it is to get on video games because it just wipes everything else out. I don't recommend that. I mean, that really becomes a hook and, and um, it's hard to find other things once you move to that. But reading is a good one. Um, positive affirmations, teach them things to say that kind of um, reflect positively on themselves. You know, um, I'm going to think about the people that I helped today. I'm going to think about the good things that I did today. Um, I know that I'm a good student in school. I know that I'm good at these things, you know, different kind of positive things they can think about while they're falling asleep. Thank you. I think those are some great suggestions. Um, Danny, I think we will, thank you, Dr. McGowan. We really appreciate your expertise and just talking to parents about the challenges that we're all facing right now. I really appreciate your time tonight and I know everybody else does too. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, Danny, I think sure. we are yeah. back to you. Okay, for sure, Dr. McCown, thank you so much for uh, speaking with our group. Um, a, a lot of your message resonated with me personally. Besides having two GT kids in the program, I'm a graduate of the Northside GT program and so I can you know, we definitely have some some strong personalities in the household, uh, and and and, uh, and to emphasize something that Roxanne mentioned, uh, which I tell people a lot, and it's kind of really the purpose of this group, is that when you look at the overall population uh, and and the rate of GT students, you know, between five and ten percent in a class of twenty, that that may be one or two kids. Your kid may be the only GT kid in your class, 
Um, and so sometimes that can feel kind of isolating. Uh, but in this, you know, in a district of over 100,000 kids, there's like eight, seven or 8,000 kids in the district. Um, and, and so you'll find uh, that your experience um, is not necessarily unique. Uh, and that, that there's a lot of people in, in that company with you trying to go through the same challenges. And so I'll, I'll just emphasize to the parents uh, something I try to emphasize every meeting, which is don't be afraid to ask for help. When you are lost, when you don't know what's going on with your kid, you need to ask for help. You ask their GT teachers, you ask their teachers, uh, you can come to the GT council and we'll try to, try to push you in the right direction for the right resources uh, that, that we can. But, but it, the first step comes with, with uh, acknowledging, hey, hey, I need help, this is, this is hard. <laughs> and uh, throughout the pandemic, I think a lot of us have really, really run into that, uh, not just with our kids, but with ourselves and, and through all of this. And so don't, don't be afraid, we're all, we're all going through this together, we're all challenging, we're all failing at something. There's something that we need to get done that is not getting done, and that's okay. That's okay because uh, the goal right now is to stay healthy and to take care of our friends and our family and, and, uh, and our kids. So, so just be, you know, just be who you can be, get what you can done. And when you're lost or, 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 uh, or when you're in trouble, just ask for help. That's what, that's what we're here for. This is the idea of the community. So uh, Dr. McCallum, thank you so much for your, for your message and for sharing those thoughts with us, because I think uh, it, it really, really goes to, to share the experience, uh, to share the experience that we all have. Um, so, so thank you so much. Uh, and, and with that, we're, we're going to get ready to, uh, to wrap up our meeting. We definitely appreciate uh, everybody's time. We, we do have a, a, a good calendar coming together. For those of you who, who are, are new to the group, uh, we usually meet four times a year. Uh, this year, our third meeting will be uh, the meeting that has Dr. Woods, the superintendent of Northside, uh, speaking. It, it's, it's always a, a good time. He comes and he, and he shares his perspective on the GT program uh, from the district perspective, and it's a great time for us to, uh, to ask him questions about, about how he prioritizes that um, and, and in, anything that, that comes to mind. So um, look forward to uh, our, our agenda coming together. We're going to try to have a, a few other activities and speakers throughout the year, um, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be here. So uh, again, all of y'all, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you to our speaker, and uh, if there's anything uh, we can do, just let us know. Uh, y'all take care and have a great evening. Dr. McCallum, Thank you, everybody. Can we share your website with everybody? Sure, sure. I will Thank drop you. that in the chat. Perfect. Okay. Meredith is going to put Dr. McGowan's info in the chat. And for any parents left, our next meeting is November 4th. And then the one that Danny was talking about is February 24th with Dr. Woods. So we look forward to seeing you then. I think Meredith is getting that in the chat for you. Oh, she's got it in there. Thank you everybody for coming. We appreciate it. Meredith, thank you so much for your tech help tonight. No problem. All right, everybody have a great evening. Thank you again, Dr. McCown. Thank you so much.